One of the knowledge areas that project managers have to become familiar with is procurement. And one of the more complicated elements of procurement is running a tender process. So in this video, I want to answer the question, how do you deliver a tender process? Tender processes can be long and complicated and they become longer and more complicated the closer you get to the public sector in most countries. That said, I'm going to divide the process up into 17 steps, but recognize that for your project and for your organization, you may not need all of these steps or you may be able to combine them conveniently. Why so many? Because by distinguishing steps, make it easier to understand exactly what's going on. And the first of these is to determine requirements. Figure out what it is that you need to procure through a tender process. Step two is to document those requirements and you'll do that mainly in the tender documents, but possibly also in a draft contract. Now, you're going to need to evaluate the different bids you receive to comply with the tender. And in doing so, you need to recognize that all aspects of your requirements are not going to be of equal value and importance to you and to your stakeholders. So step three is to determine the relative priorities among all the components of your tender requirements. Examples will include things like quality, different aspects of the functionality, operational arrangements, timeliness, the all important cost, and other commercial matters like the standing of the bidder. My recommendation is you gather together key stakeholders to determine the relative importance and therefore apply weightings to each component of the tender documents. And here is a simple plea from me. Please, please, please do not treat everything as being equally valuable and therefore simply award the tender contract to the cheapest, lowest bidder. Sometimes that will be appropriate. Sometimes you will have absolute standards of compliance or non-compliance on every component, and therefore a fully compliant bid is entirely acceptable, and the best thing to do, therefore, is to take the lowest price bid. But for many, many projects, this will be too simplistic an approach and will not be appropriate. What you're interested in optimizing is value, not cost. Cost on its own is only one component of value. Fourth, you need to create an evaluation framework so that you can evaluate the bids against your requirements. Often this takes the form of a scoring process that will score the responses to each requirement, possibly as either compliant or non-compliant, but again, Often there are going to be degrees of compliance and therefore a maximum score will be awarded to something that is totally compliant and obviously everything we want. And then for bidders who are not able to offer everything we could possibly want, we might give them a lower score. When we multiply that score by the weighting, we create weighted scores which are used for evaluating the bids. Fifth, you need to set a tender deadline. This is the deadline by which bidders need to submit their tender documents. And as part of this, you also need to set the whole process timeline. There will be lots of key dates, possibly including the point at which you announce the preferred bidder. Sixth, you need to bring the opportunity to the attention of bidders. In many jurisdictions, particularly in the public sector, this will be through advertising and advertising in trade journals or in specified documents. In the European Union, there's the official journal, which contains all public sector procurements. But if you're not going to advertise, you need to find suitable bidders and contact them and invite them to tender. Seventh, you might want some form of pre-qualification stage to find out whether prospective bidders are suitable and capable of providing what you need. And often this comes with a pre-qualification questionnaire, a PQQ. Bidders who are able to satisfactorily complete the pre-qualification stage will receive a formal ITT, 
invitation to tender, or an RFP, request for proposal. You will always be wise to secure as much assurance from prospective bidders that they are intending to tender as you can. That way you can know whether you're likely to have a competition with enough bidders to make it a proper competition and therefore properly competitive. If you don't get enough bidders, you will need to widen your net and invite more people to respond. At number eight, we need to create a bidder briefing. This will often take the form of briefing documents, a tender pack of some sort, but may also include an informal or formal face-to-face -face briefing session where you gather together the prospective bidders and you present to them and possibly answer their questions there and then. Number nine may or may not happen. You need to determine whether you are going to answer bidders' questions and what the process will be. Often, you'll ask them to submit requests for information, RFIs, or TQs, technical questions or technical queries. It's good practice always to gather together all of their inquiries, to document them all, and then to respond with answers to all of the inquiries to all of the bidders. That way, ensuring a level playing field and making sure that everyone knows as much as everyone else. However, if you're in the public sector, there will almost certainly be a set of rules with which you have to comply, and therefore those come ahead of any suggestions or guidance that I might give. Tenth, you need to brief your evaluation team. They need to understand the context, they need to understand the tender documentation, and they need to understand the process by which they're going to evaluate bids against the documentation. What is the mechanism for scoring and how do they apply the weightings. Number 11 is to receive the bids, which doesn't sound like much, but it's very important, particularly in public procurements with rules, because they will often state that you may not receive and you certainly may not open a bid that arrives after the deadline. And I have had experience of waiting in the reception area of an office building for the last bids to arrive and having a timer with me. And yes, when a bid arrived late, I had to mark it as non-compliant and seal it in a locked room, never to be opened. The tendering organization that invested a lot of its time and a lot of its money in putting together that tender received no value for its effort. We will never know, they will never know, whether their tender would have been compliant or even the winning tender. If you're ever on the other side of the transaction and putting together a tender, it is crucial that you think about the logistics of getting your tender to the right place at the right time. Number 12 is a big one. We need to evaluate the bids that we receive. Firstly, we will do a triage of every bid to ensure that all of them are compliant. Any bid that is non-compliant either in terms of the process by which it has been created or the content needs to get put to one side. The compliant bids can therefore be evaluated for their performance against the tender requirements. Inevitably, you will find uncertainties and you will need clarifications from the bidders around certain elements of their bids. Now, again, the rules of your tender process may say that you may not see clarification and if something is unclear, it needs to be scored in a certain way. However, if you are able to seek clarifications, that's step 13. And step 14 is to make the choice to select the preferred bid. This is often known as the most economically advantageous tender or meet. However, you may have a longer process still that involves shortlisting and interviewing potential bidders from the shortlist before making your final decision about the most economically advantageous bid. That is to say, you will have a chance to clarify factors and receive additional information. Once again, with many public procurements, this stage is not allowed. However, in the commercial sector, often the pitch or the presentation is a vital part, particularly when we're looking at services which are driven as much by personality and confidence in the professionals 
as they are by objective fact. Step 15 is to notify your preferred bidder. And it's crucial here that you secure confirmation from your preferred bidder that they are prepared to go forward on the basis of their tender before notifying any other bidder that they have been unsuccessful. Because if they're not prepared to go through with it, you then need to revert to your second preferred bidder. At this stage, you will also need to prepare yourself to give feedback to the unsuccessful bidders. And again, your detailed processes and procedures may specify what you can and cannot say and how you can and cannot deliver that feedback. Step 16 will often have some form of contract negotiations to finalize the details of the contract. But remember, the bid itself will form a component of that contract and therefore the contract has to be consistent with the bid. If during those negotiations, the bidder tries to vary the terms of the bid, then you need to be prepared to go and evaluate whether under those varied terms, the bid would still have been successful. Assuming the negotiations go well, then step 17 is where the whole tender process ends. It's when you sign the final contract and become contractually related to your new supplier. Please do give a thumbs up if you've learned from this video. I'll be creating loads more project management content, so please do subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so that YouTube knows to make sure you don't miss any of it. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one.